Getting laid off was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Hi, my name is Daniel, and this is the Engineering Success Podcast, episode 43. Hope you guys are doing all right. And for those of you that are on team of Baby Tracker, we are about three, three and a half weeks away from Baby E making their appearance into this world if they come on their due date, which uh, we're told is not likely to be the case, but we're prepared. The nursery's ready. The go bags are packed. The cars are stocked. Uh, Everything is unpacked and we are ready to welcome them into this world. So we are really excited about that. Uh, We have a very fun episode ahead of us today. But before we do that, let's go ahead and do our shout outs. Shout out to John Ott for supporting the podcast. Thank you so much, John, for being a top tier supporter of the podcast. I really appreciate your support, John. Uh, You too can join John Ott as a top tier supporter of the podcast by donating on Patreon or on Spotify for podcasters. The links to do that are in the description box below. Ten bucks a month gets you a shout out at the beginning of every single episode of the podcast for your favorite business name, your personal name, any safe for work phrase, emoji, you name it. I will read it out at the beginning of the episode if you ask me to. Thank you so much, John, for your continued support of the podcast. Also, if you want to get a shout out at the beginning of the episode, you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or send that in to me elsewhere. Um, just make sure to send, send that to me. And uh, also, if you send me a five-star review and your mailing address, um, then I will send you a sticker in the mail. Uh, For those of you that haven't seen our stickers yet, and those of you that are watching in the video version of the podcast, the stickers look like this. They're very exciting. It's just our logo in white with our at symbol at E-N-G-R-I-N-G success, which is where you can find us on all the social media platforms on it. Uh, Please consider leaving a review and I will get you a sticker. If you just want a sticker, write into me and you will definitely 100% get a sticker if you become a top tier supporter of the podcast. In fact, I will give you 10 stickers. If you become a top tier supporter, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll give you a bunch of stickers if you become a top tier supporter of the podcast. But all right. Well, we have a wonderful interview coming up ahead of us with Aaron Monker. Aaron is the founder and CEO of Pipeline Design and Engineering. It's a really good interview that we have here. We talk about his journey to becoming a founder of his own company and what he does and and how he does it. Um, his background is, is he has his bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from BYU. Um, he got his master's in science in bioengineering from Arizona State University. Um, and he had a long, he's had a long and successful career in the field of bioengineering, which is, uh, which is really pretty cool. Um, for those of you that are interested in uh, biotech, um, biomedical engineering, uh, you're definitely going to want to watch this episode or listen to this episode. But yeah, I really enjoyed my time with Aaron. Aaron is also the host of the Being an Engineer podcast, which is a much larger podcast in the engineering career space. So if you haven't had the chance to listen to it yet, it is available on all your preferred podcast providers. So make sure to give them a listen as well and maybe even let them know that we sent you there. But anyways, without any further ado, you're going to enjoy this interview. Please listen in to learn more about Aaron Monker's career on how he got here, owner of Pipeline Design and Engineering. Hey, Aaron, how are you doing? Happy to be here. You know, uh, the, my, my favorite answer to that question is I'm just grateful to be alive, grateful to be here. Yeah, me too, man. That's what I tell myself every morning as I'm as I'm driving to work, and when everybody says, "Hi, how are you doing?" It's uh, it is a blessing to be here in every day. How was your day? It was a busy day. Um, we started off with uh, doing some video and photos. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. Here's a little insider scoop. All of the photos and videos on our website of different case studies, right? We'll finish a project and we'll take some pictures and, and video of this project so we can do a case study and put it up on our, our website, use it for marketing. I do all of those photos and videos, which 
arguably is not the best use of my time, but I enjoy it. And I actually have a background in, in photography. I had a photography company with a friend of mine that we ran for five or six years, um, but quite a, quite a while ago. And um, I, I have a pretty, uh, how do I want to say this? I'm picky about what these photos and videos look like, right? Yeah. I want to make sure that the uh, projects that we do are per portrayed in, in the best light possible. So anyway, I spent uh, uh, three hours this morning with another team member who was helping out doing pictures and video of a project that we recently completed. And yeah. then um, I won't go through all the details of my whole day, I promise. I'm not going to bore everyone. But uh, something else that we do here that's kind of cool is we have team lunch together every Wednesday. Oh, that's so good. Today was was team lunch day and uh, then just a bunch of other meetings. And uh, I actually recorded a, a podcast for for our podcast earlier today as well. So just lots of lots of things going on today. It was pretty much back to back stuff all day. Yeah, that that's exciting. It, it, it's I think it's I think that's one of the perks of of being the being the boss, right? Is you get to have that that big time say on on the way that your brand is is portrayed, and uh, that's really exciting that you get to explore that interest in in your role. I've always had that similar interest. That's why I mean that's why I kind of do this podcast. I produce it and do all this stuff because that's where I have a lot of fun. So that's kind of cool that you get to do that in your day to day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, team lunch sounds sounds like fun. What did I what did I do for lunch? I think I ate lunch at three o'clock today, and then <laughs> it was one of those like days where, right there. It's... Yeah, yeah. So I know that everybody doesn't really care about um, what I ate for lunch. Uh, they, they're here to hear more about what you do, and and you did a really good job at hinting at uh, the things that you do. But what I what I'd like to do for the podcast is kind of talk through how you got to doing what you're doing now and what will have played before this is I would have given an interview on you and and your certifications and, and what you're doing now. Uh, I keep on saying, I think it's an interview. I meant to say introduction. For some reason, I keep on interchanging those words. I did on the last uh, podcast as well. But um, what I want to do is I want to know where your journey as an engineer started. And for you, you got your bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from BYU. So why did you choose BYU? Well, for uh, a few reasons. I grew up um, in a, uh, uh, a faith-based household, and BYU is um, uh, owned by the, the, the church of which I belong. And mm -hmm. so there were non-technical reasons for wanting to go there. Um, just, I guess, continuing my my uh, faith-based education as well. That was an element of it. Also, the, the, the church heavily subsidizes tuition there. So it was inexpensive for me to go there. And honestly, that was one of the big, the big drivers. I think, yeah. uh, I think tuition for me was like $1,500 per semester, something like that. Oh my you know, goodness. Was, oh yeah. It was really very affordable. So that was a big driver for choosing BYU. And they also have a very good uh, engineering program. So yeah. all those things together kind of just, it made a lot of sense to go there. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, you grew up in Hawaii. Doesn't BYU have a, a, a university in Hawaii as well? Yeah, they why, do. <laughs> why, did, why, why would you leave the beautiful sunny paradise that's Hawaii? Yeah, exactly. Um, my brother went to BYU Hawaii and he loved it. He had a great experience there. I kind of wanted to get away a little bit. Um, not yeah. not because I was running from anything. I had a wonderful childhood, my a super strong supportive family and parents. I just wanted to be on my own kind of an experience um, a, a little bit of um, independence, I suppose. And yeah. uh I probably would have had that largely even at, at BYU Hawaii, but they don't have an engineering program there and uh, oh. BYU and Utah has a, a really good one. So a couple of reasons why I chose to go there. Yeah, that's cool. And it sounds like you had a really good experience there as well. And, and you graduated and then you immediately transitioned into industry after that. How was that transition for you getting your first job coming out of school? It was less intentional than I would like to say. Uh, when I, I remember right before I graduated, I interviewed for a job with an automotive company. It was an automotive supplier. It wasn't one of the big auto companies, but 
I flew out to, where was it? Ohio or something, somewhere out in that area. And the, the job was to design wire harnesses for automotive. And it was super boring. And I, 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 I share this story because I didn't have a, a very specific idea of what I wanted to do after graduating. And so I think it was a career fair or something. And I bumped into this company and they're like, oh, you should come out and interview us, interview with us. So I said, okay, great. I'll, I'll go out and interview with you. I, I didn't have uh, uh, a very well-planned path for what I was going to do after graduation. So I interviewed there and it was, it was just awful. It, it felt like, oh, I, I would, I would not enjoy being in this environment. Uh, it was kind of boring, mundane work. Right. And I thought, wow, is this what engineering is going to be? This, this sounds like drudgery. And a roommate of mine decided that he was going to go into biomedical engineering. And so he was talking about biomedical engineering and I didn't really understand what it was. Even I said, what is that? What's biomedical engineering? What do you do? And he had this internship. I think it was with uh, Edwards maybe. Anyway, it was a large medical device company and he was sharing a few of the things that he was going to do in his internship. And I thought that sounds really cool. Like working with the body and understanding anatomy and devices that that work in the body. I think I might like to learn more about that. So instead of just uh, graduating and going off and finding a job, I thought I'm going to get a master's degree in bioengineering. So that's what I did. Uh, flew down to Arizona and did a master's degree in bioengineering. And one thing led to another. There's a company down here who hired me as an intern uh, doing testing, uh, medical device testing. Wow. And then from there, they introduced me after I graduated with my master's to a, a company down here that uh, was an engineering services company. So I wow. got hired on there. And that's that's where I really started my engineering career doing really fun work, uh, not boring drudgery design designing wiring harnesses, but it was an engineering services company. So they had a lot of different projects coming through. I was mostly focused on doing medical device design and mm -hmm. um, just, I got to do fun things, right? I got to do CAD design. I got to go out and machine parts out in the lab. I got to build things and test things and do assembly work and 3D printing and a uh, little bit of uh, manufacturing documentation and just all these different things that were, were really a, a lot of fun. And that's kind of how I, I got into the beginning of my career as an engineer. That's exciting. So when I look at your LinkedIn and I look at your career progression, you had a, a quick little stop doing drywall tools, but then you then you said you kind of started that internship. I assume that's whenever you were a test engineer at biomechanics. Is that is that what you were talking about when you're describing working while you were in your master's? Yeah, the, the drywall tools, that was, uh, uh, I guess, really, that was the start of my career as an engineer, although I was a student still back then. I was an intern oh, really? at that company. Yeah, that was towards the end of my bachelor's degree career or mm -hmm. time, and it bled into the master's degree. I think I, I worked for that same company for five or six months after I moved to Arizona, but it was pretty cool. The uh, company wanted to start their own line of, of drywall tools, and I'd never worked with like drywall i didn't i didn't know what like, those tools were or, or how they were used but i got to learn um uh, uh, about them and we basically took a competitor's family of tools and my job was to reverse engineer all of them with a pair of calipers and then yeah. create our own cad models and in, in pro e back then it wasn't even wildfire it was pro e back then yeah. And so I did that and and like that, that was really my first experience to doing real uh, engineering design work. And, and I loved it. Super fun. I had a great time, learned a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, and then from there, went into an internship with that testing, medical testing place, and then finally to the engineering services company. Yeah, I can actually, you know, envision in the back of head, my head, the wheels are turning at, at how relevant, you know, that that reverse engineering and that um the measurements would be would would end up being probably to your career now and when y'all are designing test equipment. So what was your what was your load like whenever you were an intern and, and doing your masters? Was it a pretty heavy load? What was that that balance like for you in your life at that point in time? It felt um it didn't feel overwhelming most of the time, but mm -hmm. you know, it was an engineering degree and so there was a lot of work. I don't think I was 
ever a natural student. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I like to talk about the fact that there are two types of intelligence. There's analytical intelligence and there is practical intelligence. And analytical intelligence is, is largely what you are tested on at school. And mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, maybe middle of the road there. My analytical mm -hmm. intelligence is it's good enough, but it's not stellar. My mm -hmm. practical intelligence, I think, is pretty good. Uh, but I, I kind of struggled in school. I thought it was really hard. Um, I was always in the labs getting extra help from uh, um, tutors and things like that. Uh, we had groups for all the different classes. I, I made sure to find a group for all the different classes so I could study with other people and and uh, learn from them. So, uh, you know, full days for sure. We'll go to uh, campus 730, 8 a.m. And, and get back to the apartment at 6 p.m. or so and probably do some homework after that. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't love school, to be honest. I, I love the like kind of the social aspect of it, but um, uh, I didn't love going to school to become an engineer. I enjoy being an engineer in industry a lot more than the schooling portion of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally sympathize with that as well. I, I kind of viewed it at, at the time as kind of a means to an end. And I was able to find joy and, and excitement in the indiv you know, individual unique aspects of things. But it was really kind of, for me, a, a test of my willpower and resilience uh, to, like you know, the, I, there's something beyond this that I know is really exciting and school is doing a really good job of giving me glimpses of what that is going to look like, but I'm just not quite there yet. And, and, totally. and that was kind of, it's yeah, it was, it was always like light at the end of the tunnel, right? It, 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 the entire yeah. time during college is like, yeah. there's something there, there's something there. And because of that, as you said, my social experiences with my colleagues, I mean, those are the people that are going to be my friends for life. They were in town for Mardi yeah. Gras this year. So yeah, it's, it's just it's like, like you went to war together, right? No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's why we developed such good relationships with our coworkers too, potentially. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. coming out of school, you 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 worked for, as a design engineer for Phoenix, and that was kind of you transitioned out of your intern into your first full time role at Phoenix, and you worked there for three years before moving on to your next role at ServiceLink. What what was that transition like for you, moving from one medical device design company to this other company where? What was Surface Inks doing? Were they, were they also a medical device or was it a little bit different? I have done a horrible job at keeping my LinkedIn up to date. So uh, <laughs> there are some holes there that don't make sense if you don't know the, the, the backstory. So the backstory is in 2009, I got laid off from the uh, oh. where I was working. At PADT is the name of the company. Great company, wonderful people, super smart engineers. Um, the recession hit and they had to let some people go. And and honestly, I was a good choice to let go. They made the right decision. And the reason for that was I had become fairly disengaged with the work, which was weird really? because when I started, I loved it. You know, I got to do all these fun things that I loved. I mentioned before prototyping, CAD design, uh, some machining, assembly, drawings, all these fun engineering things. But uh, I don't know, two and a half, three years in, uh, I started becoming disengaged and I just didn't love what I was doing there. And I, you know, back then, I, I think that I'm a lot more introspective now than I was back then. And I didn't really think that much about it. I just kind of did my thing. Uh, but the people there were really smart and they they knew that I wasn't super engaged anymore. So when the time came, they had to let some people go, hey, probably makes sense to let Aaron go. It doesn't seem like he's super thrilled to 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 be doing this work. So that happened. Cool. And um, it was kind of a like existential crisis, right? I thought, maybe I don't like engineering anymore. Maybe I need to do something totally different now. So I, I, I was actually doing photography on the side with a friend of mine. We had this side business that we were doing. I had started uh, my own little web design company that I was also doing on the side. And I, I explored those even more after I got laid off. I also, uh, I was looking at commercial real estate, like just really different things, right? Not engineering at all, thinking, ah, I don't think I like engineering anymore. I think I, I maybe I want to do something totally different. So about this time when, when I'm uh, contemplating what my future holds as far as career, my father-in-law pulls me aside one day and he says, hey, 
you went to school for a long time to become an engineer. Are you sure that you just want to throw it away uh, all of a sudden? And uh, he suggested that maybe what I had fallen out of love with was not engineering as a discipline, but just the way in which I was doing engineering. And and it, truth be told, I, I did feel like I was micromanaged uh, a lot back when I was working at this other company. And there's nothing wrong with that. I was a young engineer. I, I probably needed the guidance. Although I, I remember this other experience uh, there when I I was loaned to another engineering manager at the company, and I really thrived under him. Uh, all of a sudden, I was I was super engaged. I was I was doing great work, and the the owners at the company were so perplexed by this. Right? Like, why is he so disengaged? with all the other work he's been doing, but we we loan him to this other manager, other project, and all of a sudden he is Johnny on the spot, getting stuff done, super engaged, great work. They couldn't figure it out, and honestly, I couldn't for a long time either, and I'll, I'll get back to that. But uh, so let's see, where was I? I think I, I lost my train of thought there. What was I saying? You were uh, talking about how you got loaned away and you were making your transition and, and realizing what you enjoyed the most. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe my father-in-law's right. I'm, I'm just not loving the way in which I was doing engineering, kind of being micromanaged. Right. Um, and so I thought I'll, I'll give this a shot on my own. I'll try getting some contract jobs, see if I can freelance a little bit. So I did that and, and I found some, uh, freelance jobs and surface Inc was one of the first, uh, mm -hmm. A friend of mine was working there from college, and and she reached out and said, "Hey, I see you're freelancing. We we need some contract help. Uh, are you free?" And I said, "Yeah, for sure. That's great." So I did some uh, contract work there. I think it was only I don't know three months or four months, something like that. Um, but things slowly and surely um, uh, rolled along, and uh, before I knew it, I was I was looking for my own contractors to help because the workload had increased and. And a few, a few years later, I ended up hiring, uh, you know, my first employee and then and then a few more and then a few more. We're still a very small company. But uh, what what I finally realized about why I had thrived under this one manager and, and not under um, others was that this this one manager, he kind of he, he gave me an objective and he said, just go figure it out. Uh, there wasn't a lot of micromanaging. Uh, I mm -hmm. I almost got to. Um, I almost got to manage myself in a way. Uh, and what I, what I learned is that I, I don't like being a cog in the machine. I don't like being told, here's this one little piece, you go focus on that. I like having much higher level ownership over uh, the whole project. And so once I started working for myself, I was no longer a cog in the machine. I was the machine. I was doing yeah. everything, right? And that was transformational for me. And I realized I do still like engineering a lot. As long as I can have this high level ownership and kind of direct my path, as long as I have this autonomy, this freedom to um, uh, do engineering the way that that I want to do it, I, I really loved it. And it just happened, you know, like that. It was like a overnight switch, really. And, and I was back in it. In fact, when I started working for myself, I, I worked probably 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks, yeah. pretty regularly. And it was fine. I, I was happy to do that. It was great. Whereas back when I was working for another company, I hit 40 hours and I was out of there. You know, yeah. I didn't, didn't want to stay there any longer than I had to. But once, once I owned that entire process myself, uh, putting in long hours just wasn't a problem. Yeah. And, and so whenever your company started, you, you said that you started getting like contract after contract and it just kind of stayed in that same niche of things that you already knew how to do. At what point did you realize that, you know, this is a an actual business? This is just this is no longer things that I can I, I can do as a contract here and there. I need to actually turn this into a, a business. Yeah. This is something my wife and I have joked about for a long time. For probably nine or ten years, I would say pipeline's not a real business. And this was it was kind of tongue in cheek, but there was also a yeah. note of seriousness to it. I would say pipeline's not a real business. It's just we're a bunch of engineers who 
really like designing things and, and we happen to have some work and people are paying us to do it, but it's not a real business. You know, the next month, everything is going to explode and, and uh, I'll need to figure out something else. It wasn't until maybe three years ago or so that uh, I, I really, truly started to feel like, oh, Pipeline is a real business and yeah. the, we're going to be around for a long time. This is an enduring company, not just something I'm doing right now. Yeah. And, and you have a lot of other people that are involved now, too, that probably appreciate that you have that that sentiment <laughs> as well, yeah. as well. Yeah, and I'm sure they do. And, and I think it could turn into a whole other episode about how how, how you are setting the um, the foundation for that to be the success and, and all the transitions that you're making there. But really, I, what I'm curious in is uh, now we've kind of alluded to it a bunch, but can, can you tell my audience a little more, bit more about what Pipeline is and, and what industries you serve? Yeah, when we started, we did general product design. So it may have been a medical device, it may have been an iPhone case, it may have been solar power equipment. It was very general and broad. In 2000, I think it was 2013, one of our medical device customers said, hey, we need a test fixture. Can you design that for us? And we said, great, we'd love to do that. We designed it, delivered it. They loved it. They said, we, know, we need more of this kind of thing, these like test fixtures. Can you do more of this for us? We said, great, we'd love to. So we started doing uh, a lot of test fixture design for this one medical device company. And that went on for several years. And as we did more and more of these test fixtures, uh, we kind of got into that 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 niche and uh, to the point where most of our business was doing fixtures and equipment and less was focused on general product design, like consumer mm -hmm. products, things like that. We still do uh, a little bit of consumer product design, but these days the vast majority of what we do is machine design, automation, custom equipment, inspection stations, test fixtures. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just kind of naturally grew into automation. So industrial automation is something that we do a lot of as well, but custom equipment, custom manufacturing equipment, manufacturing being loosely defined it's not just to like actually manufacture a product it might be to test uh the functionality of a product it might be to assemble a product it might be to inspect a product but custom manufacturing equipment is is what we do now that's cool and so what what kind of projects or what aspects of a project whenever you are you're bidding or you're considering work that you do or, or maybe you just work comes across your desk uh, what what projects get you the most excited what characteristics of opportunities just make you most thrilled to to know that that's an opportunity for you guys it's a double-edged sword we are you know, quintessential engineers, we love to solve problems. We love yeah. to be given a design challenge, a technical challenge, and and figure out what the answer is. So we love to do R&D. Uh, we, we love to do a lot of process development. It's really expensive to do that, though. And sometimes we're guilty of creating more than we should because it's fun to create. Yeah versus going out and finding, you know, maybe this aspect of the machine, there's already a solution out there. We just need to buy it and integrate it. And we do plenty of that as well. But there's an argument to be made that we spend more time creating than we really need to, because that's just what we love to do. That's what's fun, right? Us engineers, we love to create things. We design it in CAD, we 3D print it, we see if it works, get it machined, assemble it. So those are the projects that we really love, where there's there's uh, some heavy R and D or process yeah. development that needs to be figured out. Yeah. So how do you manage that as as a I'm just out of curiosity as a business and and tempering that excitement and also realizing oh we may be on a TNMNT contract with this client and we're kind of limited on um, maybe we're not lump sum here we're kind of limited on what kind of budget we have for this so we kind of got to be careful and, and manage those expectations with our clients as well along the way. There's no one answer for that. Um, yeah. we, so sometimes we go over budget and yeah. depending on the exact circumstances of that overage, yeah. we might ask for additional funding and we yeah. may or may not get it. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we might just say, you know what, this is totally on us. We're just going to cover this and, and we eat that cost. Um, but at the end of the day, um, 
pipeline's purpose, our overarching objective is to promote joy in the lives of our team members. Yeah. And if we were to be super rigid about this, and every time we saw one of our engineers going down a rabbit hole to to create something or just being curious, right, and said, no, stop doing that. There's already a solution to this. We're not going to spend our time doing that. That would just crush the the joy aspect. So it's a balance, right? Like many things in life, um, but we just do the best we can. And um, as long as <laughs> as long as there's enough money to pay everyone, we're, we're happy at the end of the day, which to date has always been the case. That's good. So you talk a lot about your people and, and that you're a people centric company. What kind of people are are you usually are, hire, are getting hired into pipeline? What kind of uh, backgrounds educationally or experience wise do you have uh, with your engineers on your team? We're mostly mechanical engineers. We do yeah. have a uh, uh, programmers and uh, some technicians as well but most of us are mechanical engineers what i've found is that uh the engineers who really enjoy pipeline the most are the ones that that love uh variety and mm. solving hard problems and the engineers that maybe you classify them as sustaining engineers, right? They're not they're not creating something brand new, but they're they're technically oriented and, and they're mm -hmm. sustaining a product that that already exists. Those engineers don't do well at pipeline. Mm -hmm. I think that the business we're in, it it's it's kind of a tough business model. We sell an expensive product that not many people need. And finding the right customers they're they're kind of few and far in between so when we do find the right customer it's a challenge to be efficient with our time and uh, get everything done w within budget and it requires really gifted engineers to do that mm -hmm. and uh so i've worked with a lot of engineers over the years and and uh uh not all engineers are created equally um I feel like we have a really very strong engineering team. And again, I, I've worked with a lot of engineers, so I have a pretty good sense for the the spectrum of engineers out there. And uh, the ones the ones who do well here, the ones who last here, are the ones who are, are very good at um, new product development, at, at R&D, at, at figuring out hard problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they like variety. We, you know, a project for us might last uh, it varies, but maybe three to six months is, is pretty common. So you get a, uh, a lot of opportunities to work on a lot of different things here, which is something yeah. that the, the the team enjoys a lot. And then in biotech, one of the sentiments that I've heard a lot is that you have to have a master's. And I know you have one, um, and it's obviously paid dividends for you in your career. But would you say that somebody that wants to go into biomedical engineering should kind of prepare to specialize or or pursue some kind of graduate form of education after they get their undergrad degree? I think this is changing. Um, 20 years ago, I think the answer was yes. You, you mm -hmm. Getting a master's degree is going to help your cause quite a bit. Mm -hmm. These days, I, I think that companies are starting to relax that a little bit. I know, you know, large tech companies like Google and Facebook and things like that, they they uh, don't require a college degree even anymore, let alone a, uh -huh. a, a graduate degree for a lot of their, their technical roles. I, I don't know how useful my master's degree was from a, a technical standpoint. Uh, it helped me meet some people that ended up being influential in, in how my career uh, went, but just the technical information I learned, it wasn't all that useful, if I'm being honest. So really, do you do you need a master's degree to to do well in medical device uh, engineering? I don't I don't think so, not necessarily. Um, now, if you want to work at like a, a big a big established medical device company where yeah. maybe there's a little bit more bureaucracy and um, yeah, it might be helpful there. But if you want to work at a, a smaller company, maybe a startup or or something like that, then I, I think that master's degree is not is not so important. Yeah. So so you said that that your master's maybe the the technical stuff wasn't 
it's exactly required, but what class would you say reflecting back? See, see, I've made a long circle here and I've now made it to the next question on the on the interview sheet. Um, what what kind of what class from college did you find most applicable to to what you do now? Certainly the CAD classes. Uh, really? I think by far that's what I use most in in my career. Uh, the statics classes uh, class was also helpful, right? Just understanding free body diagrams and, and how to calculate um, the forces and moments using free body di diagrams. That was that was helpful for sure. Uh, materials and and uh, an understanding of just basic engineering principles. Um, some of the simple equations like uh, buckling calculations or uh, the cantilevered deflection calculations, uh, understanding how to use those, that that was that was very useful. Um, yeah, those were probably at the top of the list. Cool. And and how how you said earlier that you weren't necessarily the best student whenever it came to the numbers game, but whenever it came to you know, in general, what kind of student were you? Were you were you pretty pretty focused, or was it kind of what what was your thing that stood out the most on your resume whenever you were coming out of college? I was very focused. Uh, I was not the 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 procrastinator who would wait until the last day to study for a test. I'd start studying, yeah. you know, two weeks in advance for the test. Uh, yeah. I was got all my homework done on time. Um, I was, yeah, I was I was diligent and focused yeah. and uh, uh, disciplined, um, but it didn't come easy to me. You know, I, yeah. I had a friend I remember who, a very close friend of mine uh, to this day, one of the smartest people I've ever met, both uh, uh, practically and um, analytically. And we had this physics class together and he, uh, uh, it was set up so that you could take the test at a testing center. So it wasn't like a specific mm -hmm. day or a specific time in a specific room. Uh, There's like a three day window during which you could just walk into this testing center and, and take it. He had not studied at all and walked past the testing center one day and just on a whim, thought ah, I'll just take it now you know might as well I'm walking past the building so I'll just take it now so he walked in and just aced it right 100% no problem me on the other hand I, I studied for you know probably a, a good solid week or something and I think I I got like a C or something on it right so it it, it was uh, academics were not my strong suit um, I, I have since learned that that's just not uh, my forte it's not where I thrive I'm I'm good enough academically, right? I'm I'm good enough uh, analytic in my analytical intelligence, um, but I'm never going to be like the the engineer who just knows all the equations, understands all the physics, knows how to apply them in every situation. Um, uh, that's not me. What I am really good at is organization and communication. And uh, something I've learned is that as an engineer, you can go to a certain level if you're let's say you're the smartest engineer in the room, mm -hmm. you can get to a certain point in your career. But if you don't have good communication skills, there is going to be a limit uh, to your advancement versus let's say that your your analytical analytical skills are, are pretty good. You know, maybe they're like 80th percentile or something. They're, they're good enough anyway. But you have really good practical intelligence, really good communication skills, organization skills. If 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 you have really good, I'll we'll just call them soft skills and good enough technical skills, there's almost no limit to how, how far you can go. So uh, you need to be uh, gifted enough when it comes to the technical skills, but, but it's really the soft skills that help take you to the next level. Yeah, thank you for answering that. And, and the reason why I asked that question is because, you know, unfortunately, I I started trending a little bit for me on YouTube recently because one of my videos about why the engineering dropout rate was so high, I guess the semester just ended and people were upset. Um, but I, I think that, you know, people lean so hard on, on GPA and, and grades and these numbers, but really, it, it, like you said, it's not the most important thing for your career development. And it shouldn't be the reason why somebody quits engineering. In my opinion, if, if you have the passion and you have the, the, organizational skills, if you can just make it through, um, I, I think it's worth pursuing and, and worth continuing to do so that that way you can do the kind of 
fun, cool jobs that the people at your company get to do. Were you that same kind of student all the way through from college to high school all the way through? Or did it kind of that motivation and that focus kind of kick into gear once you finally got to college? Yeah, it was in college. In in high school, I did fine. You know, I got mostly A's and B's. Um, I didn't have to try very hard in high school. I guess it was just yeah. easier. And I did not have good study habits. Um, I wasn't very focused. I was much more focused uh, uh, on the going to the beach and, and surfing with my friends, right? That's what I lived for during high school. Then I got to college and I realized, oh, shoot, this is a different game altogether. It was way harder. There were a lot of really smart people there. And it wasn't easy anymore. I actually had to study. I had to put in the time. So I I had to learn how to study and how to learn at college. And that was definitely a wake up call. Yeah, but it's not too late when you get to college, too. And I think that, it, you know, a lot of people also will count themselves out if they're like, oh, I wasn't the smartest. I wasn't the top of my class or, oh, you know, what, I, I don't really know how to study or also it's also a wake up call for people that, hey, you just because you did well as well in high school, there's those those skills that you need to, to develop and refine because, yeah, as you said, organizational skills, they contribute, they contributed to you getting through college and they will contribute to everybody getting through college because not unless you're that that whiz bang, you know, ultra smart wizard at engineering, then you're, you're definitely going to need those skills um, to yeah. get through. Yeah, for sure. And did you did you always know that you you wanted to be an engineer or wh where did that kind of inspiration come from for you? I was always into mechanical things growing up. You know, I'd build forts outside. I would uh, mess around with my bike, um, Legos, right? Uh, so I, I was, I, I'd say I was mechanically inclined growing up. I remember I had this, this is a, a silly story that I always tell. I had this Michael Jackson cassette tape. It was a long time ago, right? <laughs> I was probably 10 or something. And because I was uh, 10 years old and um, silly. I was convinced that someone was going to take this Michael Jackson tape from me and I had to protect it. It was my job. So I put together this elaborate Rube Goldberg alarm system using paper clips and yarn and duct tape and, and coffee cans and right just whatever I could find around so that when someone moved this Michael Jackson cassette tape off of its pedestal, it would trigger this series of events that eventually ended in a, a loud bang. And that was my alarm system. to So I would be alerted that someone was taking my Michael Jackson cassette tape. So I, I did things like this as a kid, right? I was kind of into mechanical stuff. And I didn't really understand though what an engineer was. I didn't even, I didn't really know what an engineer was. When I was a senior in high school, we uh, I was sitting around the, the dinner table uh, with my family. And my dad says, so what are you going to do when you go to college, what do you want to major in? And I said, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it that much. And he says, well, you should consider engineering. I think you'd be good at that. And I said, okay, that sounds good. Engineering it is. And that was really all the thought I gave to it. It's very embarrassing now uh, saying that, but that's that's how I got started in the, the, the major of engineering. Luckily, my dad knows me pretty well and it, it has turned out to be a good fit. I mean, similar story, to be honest. I I, I wanted to get a business right? major. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, I my dad was an engineer. My granddad was an engineer. Everybody was an engineer. I was good at math, good at physics. Uh, on ne act, uh, interesting anecdote about me, I've never done engineering design in my life in my career at all, uh, other than like design classes in college. Um, but they're like, yeah, you could get an engineering degree, and we we've all you know all the guys, everybody's got an engineering degree in our family, and. You're you're decently interested in this kind of stuff. You should get engineering. I, was like, oh, I want to study business, and they're like, you should really consider studying engineering <laughs> instead. It's gonna it's it's gonna have a little bit more dividends for you. And I did not real kind of the reason why I started the podcast because I had no idea um, how much more useful an engineering degree is in the industry than a business degree, regardless of whether or not you want to do design. But similar thing, my parents were like, you should really go engineering. I was like, I want to go <laughs> Thank business. goodness for our parents who know us well, huh? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. That, that's that's uh, what's so great about getting a degree in engineering is is you don't have to be an engineer, right? This yeah. the skills you learn, which which really comes down to learning how to learn. I think are yeah. so applicable for everything. You can do a lot with an engineering degree. Yeah. 
Exactly. And it, it has paid off so much for me. I mean, none of the roles that I've done in my career are roles that need to be done by engineers. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to do any of them at this stage in my career or as well without that engineering background. And uh, it's, it's, I'm so grateful that I had that nudge. Like, you, we're not going to pay for you to get a business degree. So at least <laughs> try with engineering first. I'm so grateful yeah. that I got that, that push. So, so what would you say to, to somebody that's in those shoes in high school um, or early in college that, that's either starting their engineering career or thinking about becoming an engineer, or maybe their parents said, Hey, you should really consider engineering. What, what, kind, what was the, the biggest piece of advice or encouragement that you'd give to somebody at that stage in their life? I don't know that I have a one size fits all type answer here. It's a very a few vague things question. Come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. A few things come to mind. I was very fortunate that my, my parents more or less funded my college experience. So I came out of school with very little debt. I had a couple of small student loans, but mostly I came out of school with, with almost no debt. So when I started earning a salary as an engineer, it wasn't an incredible salary. I think I started off around 60,000 a year and that was back in 2006, I think. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I didn't, I, all that money went towards living. I didn't have to pay back any loans. So that's one thing to consider because school is expensive. I mean, it's even more expensive now than, than it was back then. I, I think, I, think I, I read somewhere that ASU, uh, Arizona State University, something like 7,500 a year, or, or maybe that was even a semester. Plus there's like living expenses if you're yeah. out of state and not living at home. So going to school- That sounds affordable right now, really by the way. Expensive. That sounds okay, affordable. I, I'm probably <laughs> wrong. That was probably like eight years ago. I heard. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. You, you know, you, you you you'll probably pay. I don't know, eighty grand or something to to get a college education in engineering these days. That's a lot of money. And if you don't have, if you have to borrow that money in order to pay for it, that's a lot of money that you have to pay back. Uh, and and that's four years that you could have been working if you wanted to and earning money as opposed yeah. to just going more and more in debt. So that's one one piece to consider. Um, what else would I say? Uh, it, it's a good idea to get a, a an engineer degree still. You know, I talked about how some of these companies aren't requiring engineering degrees for some of their technical positions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think maybe 10 or 20 years from now, maybe engineering degrees are, are even less necessary if that's the field that you want to go into because there are so many other avenues for education nowadays, right? With the mm -hmm. internet, there's so many ways to learn uh, outside of the, the traditional college curriculum. But I, I don't think we're quite there right now. And if you want to be an engineer, you should, you should get a degree in engineering. That's like the easiest, most straightforward, safest way to do it. If mm -hmm. your situation doesn't allow for that, right? You can't afford it, whatever life circumstances. I don't think that's the only way to become an engineer. Um, in fact, we employ uh, some people here at Pipeline who are, I 100% I consider to be fully fledged engineers, but they don't have a degree in engineering. And, you know, maybe they started working at, at, at a machine shop or, um, they, they got like a kind of a technician level job where you don't necessarily need a degree, but you can get your foot in the door at least. Yeah. And then you start learning things on the job and, uh, a, a little bit of on the job training, plus some, uh, uh, resourcefulness of your own, finding places online to learn, doing your own projects, um, you, you know, YouTube videos, whatever you can amass quite a bit of, of knowledge and capability outside of a university. And there are plenty of companies. I mean, Pipeline is a great example. I, I don't really care if people have a degree, uh, if they're applying to work here. All I care about is, can you do the job? Can you yeah. do the work? So if you can demonstrate to me that you can do the engineering work, uh, I don't care if you don't have a degree, you know, and they're, they're, we're not the only company like that. So if, if you can't go to university, 
don't give up on uh, if you have this dream of being an engineer. There are other paths. It might take a little bit longer. might not be quite as direct, but there are other paths to get there. Yeah, that's good advice. I mean, similar experience. You know, I work in the super formal engineering and consulting industry, and we work for the major Fortune 500 companies as our clients, and especially in the, our piping departments, um, there's no bachelor of science and pipe engineering that I'm aware of. So most of those people, they, they came up through the field, maybe they got an associates in CAD, or they just learned how to do CAD. And then they started routing pipe as, as a drafter. And then they got promoted up to a designer role. Cause, and next thing you know, it, they're working next to mechanical engineers, process engineers, and running things with electricians throughout a system and electrical engineers through a system. And they're one of the highest paid disciplines in, in most engineering consulting firms is the people that route pipe, uh, that do pipe engineering, pipe design, we call them pipe designers, but yeah, same thing. It, 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 it is definitely, uh, you don't necessarily need the degree to work in the industry at all. I totally agree with that sentiment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so first of all, that's really good advice. And I, I really appreciate um, your insight. I think everybody has a really different answer on that and it all kind of comes from their experiences. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you, this, I think you're the first one to answer that question that way. And I, I really appreciate that, that you did. Um, so, so looking back on your career progression now, um, are there any things, moments that you're just most proud of or decisions that you made that that you are just you are most thankful for that you've made to help you get to this point where, where you are right now? Because I'd say that you've had a really successful go at it right now to this point. Getting laid off was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And it sucked at the time. I remember... We had just had our first child and we had bought this house. And so like now I've got a mortgage and a, a kid and a wife and I got laid off. And I remember going home that day and telling my wife, hey, uh, uh, I got laid off. We, we don't we don't have an income anymore. And just feeling sick to my stomach, you know, like going into panic mode. What am I going to do? Um, but everything I have now came from that branch in my past. So I am so thankful that I got laid off because I don't think I ever would have had the guts to go off on my own if I hadn't been forced into it. And it is genuinely one of the best things that ever happened to me. Thanks, Aaron. And and one of the one of the other one of the things that's come out of that obviously is your business. So where can people reach you um, at Pipeline if they're interested in your business? Yeah, yeah. So if you if you need some piece of equipment and you can't find it off the shelf somewhere, being made by you know some company, and you need a custom piece of equipment, test fixture, automation, machine design, that's that's when to come to Pipeline. You can find us online at teampipeline.us. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Aaron Monker, A-A-R-O-N-M-O-N-C-U-R. And uh, we also have a, a podcast that we do. It's called the Being an Engineer podcast on all the major podcast platforms. So a few places that, that you can find us. Thanks, Aaron. And let's let's talk a little bit more about that. What is the Being an Engineer podcast? I think the name is generally pretty self-explanatory, but why should people in my audience um, that are early career engineering professionals or aspiring engineers listen to your podcast? Well, we talk about some technical topics, but mostly it's a non-technical program. Uh, we talk a lot about communication and organization, time management, navigating corporate bureaucracies, which is uh, funny because pipeline is not a corporate bureaucracy as well. But a lot of engineers have to figure out how to navigate that. So yeah. we have we have guests on who, who talk about those things. Um, and uh, just uh, a lot of students find value, especially students, because before you actually become an engineer, you don't really know like what it is to be an engineer. 
And so we, we just talk about what it's like to actually be an engineer, right? Day to day, what what's the work like? What, what are we doing? Um, another thing we, we that has been interesting for me that I didn't fully appreciate before is just how many different roles there are within the discipline of engineering. And uh, uh, so it, it's a great way to um, connect with with people out there. Like a lot of the people that we have on our show are very approachable. You can find them on LinkedIn and connect with them. Um, you can learn about different companies out there that you might want to work for someday. You can learn about new technologies. We do tech, talk about some of the uh, some of the technical aspects as well, and um, uh, just just kind of the behind the scenes stuff that you don't learn at school, but it are really important for being a successful engineer. Yeah, and as I was listening to the, the your most recent episode uh, with the the test. I think it's Emma that, that was talking about their experience um, working as a uh, in in a test environment with engineers, and, and that was also very insightful as well. So plug for that as well. Recent listening listening to your most recent episode, I I really enjoyed it. I think that people would enjoy it as well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there there are a couple episodes in particular that if you just want to sample one or two, um, there's one by a gentleman named David O. O H. He is uh, an engineer at JPL, um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory yeah. with NASA. And that's just a phenomenal episode. He was the, oh, I'm going to mess up his title probably, but it was like the, 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 the flight director for the Mars Curiosity mission. And so like he oversaw, you know, a, a large part of that entire mission. And, and he talks about being on Mars time, living on Mars time for six weeks because they had to be uh, awake when it was was day on on Mars, so they could like guide the the, the rover, right? And uh, what is it? You, you, you like the Mars day is like 26 hours or something, as opposed to 24 hours for us. So every day he was like losing two hours, and it was so he would be awake during the day for week one or two, but then like week four and five he was. A, awake during the night and, and his whole family went on this like mission with him right they all they all were awake when he was awake and he talked about seeing the rover land on mars for the first time he's in the control room like no one else in the world has ever seen this happen and here's this rover that just landed on this alien planet how many miles away really really cool episode uh and then another really neat one that we did was with um uh, uh james hobson the the hacksmith so uh, for those of you who have um, heard of the Hacksmith, he, he's kind of a YouTube celebrity. Uh, he does these these really cool projects. He's got a whole company now, um, but they they take like comic books and and sci-fi movies and they they pick technology out of them like a lightsaber or um, uh, Captain America's um, uh, like was like a like magnetic shield or something or and they but they and they make them real right so they take these sci-fi technologies and they they figure out a way to make them real not exactly as you yeah. see them in the movies but but they're close right and uh so just listening to how he uh how he kind of came to be who he is right now the hacksmith and and all of the uh the 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 fun things that he gets to do is really neat so those two the hacksmith and david o are are two great ones to check out Thanks, Aaron. It sounds like career day at school, but for engineering people on steroids. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it sounds like uh, it sounds like honestly a phenomenal. I actually haven't listened to either of those episodes, so I've put them on my list for my 530 a.m. drive tomorrow morning. Uh, definitely Perfect. going to uh, listen to them. That's that's really exciting. And Aaron, thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate what you are doing. Um, with your podcast and, and with your career and also that, that you've taken the time to kind of share your career walk. Um, you know, our, our mission here is to, to kind of similar, similar origins, you know, to help people that don't know what it's like to be an engineer, that the journeys that you can take in your career uh, with engineering and how you can get into all these cool different roles and, and how people got to being able to do those things that these cool things that people are telling that they're doing um, on your podcast. So thank you so much um, for giving your time and, and sharing your story with my audience. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that 
interview with Aaron. I know I had a blast and I am so grateful for him giving him his time. Uh, please do take the time to listen to his podcast, the Being an Engineer podcast. And also, if you need pipeline services, make sure to hit them up as well and let them know we sent you there from Engineering Success. It's always nice for them to know. I, I don't have any financial things to gain from you telling them, but it's always nice for Aaron to be reminded how valuable his time was spent on the Engineering Success Podcast. Um, thank you for listening to this episode. If you do want to be featured on the podcast, contact me at daniel at engringsuccess.com, daniel at engineeringsuccess.com, or you can write into me at my website, engringsuccess.com. Uh, if you want a po question answered on the podcast, feel free to write in as well. And uh, otherwise, I will catch you guys in the next episode. Thank you for listening, and I will catch you hopefully next week. Bye. Communicating. I just made a pilot, then they threw me on the stations. Now I'm not complaining. Now I'm not complaining. My thoughts get complicated. I cannot explain the lameness. Never losing focus because I ain't chasing payments. Still playing in the basin while I'm working on arrangements. They heard the kid in 50 countries. Thank God that's amazing. But I'd rather think Spotify. They put me on the stations.